Hello, my name is Trace. I'm from the state of Kansas within the United States. I would like to introduce to you this channel consisting of English with a subtitle. The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor In the times of Caliph Harun al-Rashid, there lived in Baghdad a poor porter named Hinbad, who on a very hot day was sent to carry a heavy load from one end of the city to the other. Before he had accomplished half the distance, he was so tired that, finding himself in a quiet street where the pavement was sprinkled with rose water and a cool breeze was blowing, he set his burden upon the ground and sat down to rest in the shade of a grand house. Very soon he decided that he could not have chosen a pleasanter place. A delicious perfume of aloes, wood, and pastels came from the open windows and mingled with the scent of the rose water, which steamed up from the hot pavement. Within the palace he heard some music, as of many instruments cunningly played, and the melodious warble of nightingales and other birds, and by this and the appetizing smell of many dainty dishes of which he presently became aware, he judged that feasting and merrymaking were going on. He wondered who lived in this magnificent house, which he had never seen before, the street in which it stood being one which he seldom had occasion to pass. To satisfy his curiosity, he went up to some splendidly dressed servants who stood at the door and asked one of them the name of the master of the mansion. What, replied he, do you live in Baghdad and not know that here lives the noble Sinbad the sailor, that famous traveler who sailed over every sea upon which the sun shines? The porter, who had often heard people speak of the immense wealth of Sinbad, could not help feeling envious of one of whose lot seemed to be as happy as his own was miserable. Casting his eyes up to the sky, he exclaimed aloud, Consider, mighty creator of all things, the differences between Sinbad's life and mine. Every day I suffer a thousand hardships and misfortunes, and have hard work to get even enough bad barley bread to keep myself and my family alive, while luckily, Sinbad spends money right and left and lives upon the fat of the land. What has he done that you should give him this pleasant life? What have I done to deserve so hard a fate? So saying, he stamped upon the ground like one beside himself with misery and despair. Just at this moment, a servant came out of the palace and taking him by the arm said, Come with me, the noble Sinbad, my master, wishes to speak to you. Hindbad was not a little surprised at this summons, and feared that his unguarded words might have drawn upon him the displeasure of Sinbad. So he tried to excuse himself upon the pretext that he could not leave the burden that had been entrusted to him in the street. However, the lackey promised him that it should be taken care of, and urged him to obey the call so pressingly that at last the porter was obliged to yield. He followed the servant into a vast room, where a great company was seated around a table covered with all sorts of delicacies. In the place of honor sat a tall, grave man whose long white beard gave him a venerable air. Behind his chair stood a crowd of attendants eager to minister to his wants. This was the famous Sinbad himself. The porter, more than ever alarmed at the sight of so much magnificence, tremblingly saluted the noble company. Sinbad, making a sign to him to approach, caused him to be seated at his right hand, and himself heaped choice morsels upon his plate, poured out for him a draught of excellent wine, and presently, when the banquet drew to a close, spoke to him familiarly, asking his name and occupation. My lord, replied the porter, I am called Hindbad. I am glad to see you here, continued Sinbad. And I will answer for the rest of the company that they are equally pleased. But I wish you to tell me what it was that you said just now in the street. For Sinbad, passing by the open window before the feast began, had heard his complaint and therefore had sent for him. At this question, Hinbad was covered with confusion and hanging down his head replied, My Lord, I confess that, overcome by weariness and ill humor, 
I uttered indiscreet words, which I pray you to pardon me. Oh, replied Sinbad, do not imagine that I am so unjust as to blame you. On the contrary, I understand your situation and can pity you. Only you appear to be mistaken about me, and I wish to set you right. You doubtless imagine that I have acquired all the wealth and luxury that you see me enjoy without difficulty or danger, but this is far indeed from being the case. I have only reached this happy state after having for years suffered every possible kind of toil and danger. Yes, my noble friends, he continued, addressing the company, I assure you that my adventures have been strange enough to deter even the most avaricious men from seeking wealth by traversing the seas. Since you have perhaps heard but confused accounts of my seven voyages and the dangers and wonders that I have met with by sea and land, I will now give you a full and true account of them, which I think you will be well pleased to hear. As Sinbad was relating his adventures, chiefly on account of the porter, he ordered before beginning his tale that the burden which had been left in the street should be carried by some of his own servants to the place for which Sinbad had set out at first, while he remained to listen to the story. First Voyage I had inherited considerable wealth from my parents. And being young and foolish, I at first squandered it recklessly upon every kind of pleasure. But presently, finding that riches speedily take to themselves wings, if managed as badly as I was managing mine, and remembering also that to be old and poor is misery indeed, I began to bethink me of how I could make the best of what still remained to me. I sold all my household goods by public auction and joined a company of merchants who traded by sea, embarking with them at Balsora in a ship which we had fitted out between us. We set sail and took our course toward the East Indies by the Persian Gulf, having the coast of Persia upon our left hand and upon our right the shores of Arabia Felix. I was at first much troubled by the uneasy motion of the vessel, but speedily recovered my health, and since that hour have been no more plagued by seasickness. From time to time we landed at various islands, where we sold or exchanged our merchandise, and one day, when the wind dropped suddenly, we found ourselves becalmed close to a small island like a green meadow, which only rose slightly above the surface of the water. Our sails were furled, and the captain gave permission to all who wished to land for a while and amuse themselves. I was among the number, but when, after strolling about for some time, we lighted a fire and sat down to enjoy the repast which we had brought with us, we were startled by a sudden and violent trembling of the island, while at the same moment those left upon the ship set up an outcry bidding us come on board for our lives since what we had taken for an island was nothing but the back of a sleeping whale. Those who were nearest to the boat threw themselves into it. Others sprang into the sea. But before I could save myself, the whale plunged suddenly into the depths of the ocean, leaving me clinging to a piece of wood which we had brought to make our fire. Meanwhile, the breeze had sprung up, and in the confusion that ensued on board our vessel and hoisting of the sails, and taking up those who were in the boat and clinging to its sides, no one missed me, and I was left at the mercy of the waves. All that day I floated up and down, now beaten this way, now that, and when night fell I despaired for my life. But weary and spent as I was, I clung to my frail support, and great was my joy when the morning light showed me that I had drifted against an island. The cliffs were high and steep, but luckily for me, some tree roots protruded in places, and by their aid, I climbed up at last and stretched myself upon the turf at the top, where I lay more dead than alive till the sun was high in the heavens. By that time, I was hungry, but after some searching, I came upon some edible herbs and a spring of clear water, 
and much refreshed, I set out to explore the island. Presently, I reached a great plain where a grazing horse was tethered. And as I stood looking at it, I heard voices talking, apparently underground. And in a moment, a man appeared who asked me how I came upon the island. I told him my adventures and heard in return that he was one of the grooms of Mihraj, the king of the island, and that each year they came to feed their master's horses in this plain. He took me to a cave where his companions were assembled, and when I had eaten of the food they set before me, they bade me think myself fortunate to have come upon them when I did, since they were giving back to their master on tomorrow, and without their aid, I could certainly never have found my way to the inhabited part of the island. Early the next morning, we accordingly set out, and when we reached the capital, I was graciously received by the king, to whom I related my adventures, upon which he ordered that I should be well cared for and provided with such things as I needed. Being a merchant, I sought out men of my own profession, and particularly those who came from foreign countries, as I hoped in this way to hear news from Baghdad and find out some means of returning there. For the capital was situated upon the seashore and visited by vessels from all parts of the world. In the meantime, I heard many curious things and answered many questions concerning my own country, for I talked willingly with all who came to me. One day, after my return, as I went down to the quay, I saw a ship which had just cast anchor and was discharging her cargo, while the merchants to whom it belonged were busily directing the removal of it to their warehouses. Drawing nearer, I presently noticed that my own name was marked upon some of the packages, and after having carefully examined them, I felt sure that they were indeed those that I had put on board our ship at Balsora. I then recognized the captain of the vessel, but as I was certain that he believed me to be dead, I went up to him and asked who owned the packages that I was looking at. There was on board my ship, he replied, a merchant of Baghdad named Sinbad. One day he and several of my other passengers landed upon what we supposed to be an island, but which was really an enormous whale floating asleep upon the waves. No sooner did it feel upon its back the heat of the fire that had been kindled that it plunged into the depths of the sea. Several of the people who were upon it perished in the waters, and among others, this unlucky Sinbad. This merchandise is his, but I have resolved to dispose of it for the benefit of his family, if I should ever chance to meet with them. Captain, said I, I am that Sinbad whom you believe to be dead, and these are my possessions. When the captain heard these words, he cried out in amazement, Alas, and what is this world coming to? In these days, there is not an honest man to be met with. Did I not with my own eyes see Sinbad drown? And now you have the audacity to tell me that you are he. I should have taken you to be a just man. And yet, for the sake of obtaining that which does not belong to you, you are ready to invent this horrible falsehood. Have patience, and do me the favor to hear my story, I said. Speak then, replied the captain. I'm all attention. So I told him of my escape and of my fortunate meeting with the king's grooms, and how kindly I had been received at the palace. Very soon I began to see that I had made some impression upon him, and after the arrival of some of the other merchants, who showed great joy at once more seeing me alive, he declared that he also recognized me. Throwing himself upon my neck, he exclaimed, Heaven be praised that you have escaped from so great a danger. As to your goods, I pray you take them and dispose of them as you please. I thanked him and praised his honesty, begging him to accept several bales of merchandise in token of my gratitude, but he would take nothing. Of the choicest of my goods, I prepared a present for King Mirraj, who was at first amazed, having known that I had lost my all. However, when I had explained to him how my bales had been miraculously restored to me, 
He graciously accepted my gifts and in return gave me many valuable things. I then took leave of him and exchanging my merchandise for sandal and aloes wood, camphor, nutmegs, cloves, pepper, and ginger, I embarked upon the same vessel and traded so successfully upon our homeward voyage that I arrived in Balsora with about 100,000 sequins. My family received me with as much joy as I felt upon seeing them once more. I bought land and slaves and built a great house in which I resolved to live happily in the enjoyment of all the pleasures of life to forget my past sufferings. Here Sinbad paused and commanded musicians to play again, while the feasting continued until evening. When the time came for the porter to depart, Sinbad gave him a purse containing one hundred sequins, saying, Take this, Hindbad, and go home. But tomorrow come again, and you shall hear more of my adventures. The porter retired, quite overcome by so much generosity, and you may imagine that he was well received at home, where his wife and children thanked their lucky stars that he had found such a benefactor. The next day, Hinbad, dressed in his best, returned to the voyager's house and was received with open arms. As soon as all the guests had arrived, the banquet began as before, and when they had feasted long and merrily, Sinbad addressed them thus. My friends, I beg that you will give me your attention while I relate the adventures of my second voyage, which you will find even more astonishing than the first. Second Voyage I had resolved, as you know, on my return from my first voyage, to spend the rest of my days quietly in Baghdad, but very soon I grew tired of such an idle life and longed once more to find myself upon the sea. I procured, therefore, such goods as were suitable for the places I intended to visit, and embarked for the second time in a good ship with other merchants whom I knew to be honorable men. We went from island to island, often making excellent bargains, until one day we landed at a spot that, though covered with fruit trees and abounding in springs of excellent water, appeared to possess neither houses nor people. While my companions wandered here and there, gathering flowers and fruit, I sat down in a shady place, and having heartily enjoyed the provisions and the wine I had brought with me, I fell asleep lulled by the murmur of a clear brook which flowed close by. How long I slept I know not, but when I opened my eyes and started to my feet, I perceived with horror that I was alone and that the ship was gone. I rushed to and fro like one distracted, uttering cries of despair, and when from the shore I saw the vessel under full sail just disappearing upon the horizon, I wished bitterly enough that I had been content to stay at home in safety. But since wishes could do me no good, I presently took courage and looked about me for a means of escape. When I had climbed a tall tree, I first of all directed my anxious glances towards the sea. But finding nothing hopeful there, I turned landward, and my curiosity was excited by a huge dazzling white object so far off that I could not make out what it might be. Descending from the tree, I hastily collected what remained of my provisions and set off as fast as I could go towards it. As I drew near, it seemed to me to be a white ball of immense size and height, and when I could touch it, I found it marvelously smooth and soft. As it was impossible to climb it, for it presented no foothold, I walked round about it seeking some opening, but there was none. I counted, however, that it was at least fifty paces round. By this time the sun was near setting, but quite suddenly it fell dark. Something like a huge black cloud came swiftly over me, and I saw with amazement that it was a bird of extraordinary size that was hovering near. Then I remembered that I had often heard the sailors speak of a wonderful bird called a rock and it occurred to me that the white object which had so puzzled me must be its egg. Sure enough, the bird settled slowly up down upon it, covering it with its wings to keep it warm. 
and I cowered close beside the egg in such a position that one of the bird's feet, which was as large as the trunk of a tree, was just in front of me. Taking off my turban, I bound myself securely to it with the linen in the rope that the rope, when it took flight next morning, would bear me away with it from the desolate island. And this was precisely what did happen. As soon as the dawn appeared, the bird rose into the air, carrying me up and up until I could no longer see the earth. And then suddenly it descended so swiftly that I almost lost consciousness. When I became aware that the rock had settled and that I was once again upon solid ground, I hastily unbound my turban from its foot and freed myself, and that not a moment too soon, for the bird, pouncing upon a huge snake, killed it with a few blows from its powerful beak, and seizing it up, rose into the air once more, and soon disappeared from my view. When I had looked about me, I began to doubt if I had gained anything by quitting the desolate island. The valley in which I found myself was deep and narrow and surrounded by mountains which towered into the clouds and were so steep and rocky that there was no way of climbing up their sides. As I wandered about, seeking anxiously for some means of escaping from this trap, I observed that the ground was strewed with diamonds some of them of astonishing size. This sight gave me great pleasure, but my delight was speedily dampened when I saw also numbers of horrible snakes so long and so large that the smallest of them could have swallowed an elephant with ease. Fortunately for me, they seemed to hide in caverns of the rocks by day and only came out by night, probably because of their enemy, the Rok. All day long, I wandered up and down the valley, and when it grew dusk, I crept into a little cave, and having blocked up the entrance to it with a stone, I ate part of my little store of food and lay down to sleep. But all through the night, the serpents crawled to and fro, hissing horribly, so that I could scarcely close my eyes for terror. I was thankful when the morning light appeared, and when I judged by the silence that the serpents had retreated to their dens, I came trembling out of my cave and wandered up and down the valley once more, kicking the diamonds contemptuously out of my path, for I felt that they were indeed vain things to a man in my situation. At last, overcome with weariness, I sat down upon a rock, but I had hardly closed my eyes when I was startled by something that fell to the ground with a thud close beside me. It was a huge piece of fresh meat, and as I stared at it, several more pieces rolled over the cliffs in different places. I had always thought that the stories the sailors told of the famous Valley of Diamonds and of the cunning way which some merchants had devised for getting at the precious stones were mere travelers' tales invented to give pleasure to the hearers, but now I perceive that they were surely true. These merchants came to the valley at the time when the eagles, which kept their eyries in the rocks, had hatched their young. The merchants then threw great lumps of meat into the valley. These, falling with so much force upon the diamonds, were sure to take up some of the precious stones with them. When the eagles pounced upon the meat and carried it off to their nest to feed their hungry broods, then the merchants, scaring away the parent birds with shouts and outcries, would secure their treasures. Until this moment, I had looked upon the valley as my grave, for I had seen no possibility of getting out of it alive. But now I took courage and began to devise a means of escape. I began by picking up all the largest diamonds I could find and storing them carefully in the leathern wallet which had held my provisions. This I tied securely to my belt. I then chose the piece of meat which seemed most suited to my purpose, and with the aid of my turban bound it firmly to my back. This done, I laid down upon my face and awaited the coming of the eagles. I soon heard the flapping of their mighty wings above me, and had the satisfaction of feeling one of them seize upon my piece of meat, and me with it, and rise slowly towards his nest, into which he presently dropped me. Luckily, 
For me, the merchants were on the watch, and setting up their usual outcries, they rushed to the nest, scaring away the eagle. Their amazement was great when they discovered me, and also their disappointment. And with one accord, they fell to abusing me for having robbed them of their usual profit. Addressing myself to the one who seemed most aggrieved, I said, I am sure if you knew all that I have suffered, you would show more kindness toward me. And as for the diamonds, I have enough here of the very best for you and me and all your company. So saying, I showed them to him. The others all crowded round me, wondering at my adventures and admiring the device by which I had escaped from the valley. And when they had led me to their camp and examined my diamonds, they assured me that in all the years that they had carried on their trade, they had seen no stones to be compared with them for size and beauty. I found that each merchant chose a particular nest and took his chance of what he might find in it. So I begged the one who owned the nest to which I had been carried to take as much as he would of my treasure. But he contented himself with one stone, and that by no means the largest, assuring me that with such a gem his fortune was made, and he need toil no more. I stayed with the merchants several days, and then as they were journeying homewards, I gladly accompanied them. Our way lay across high mountains infested with frightful serpents, but we had the good luck to escape them and came at last to the seashore. Then we sailed to the Isle of Rohat, where the camphor trees grow to such a size that a hundred men could shelter under one of them with ease. The sap flows from an incision made high up in the tree to, into a vessel hung there to receive it, and soon hardens into the substance called camphor, but the tree itself withers up and dies when it has been so treated. In this same island, we saw the, the rhinoceros, an animal that is smaller than an elephant and larger than the buffalo. It has one horn about a cubit long that is solid, but has a furrow from the base of the tip upon its traced in white lines the figure of a man. The rhinoceros fights with the elephant, and transfixing him with his horn, carries him off upon his head, but becoming blinded with the blood of his enemy, he falls helpless to the ground, and then comes the rock, and clutches them both up in his talons, and takes them to feed his young. This doubtless astonishes you, but if you do not believe my tale, go to Rohat and see for yourself, for fear of wearying you. I pass over in silence many other wonderful things which we saw in this island. Before we left, I exchanged one of my diamonds for much goodly merchandise, by which I profited greatly on our homeward way. At last we reached Belsora. I hastened to Baghdad, where my first action was to bestow large sums of money upon the poor, after which I settled down to enjoy tranquility the riches I had gained with so much toil and pain. Having thus related the adventures of his second voyage, Sinbad again bestowed a hundred sequins upon Hinbad, inviting him to come again on the following day and hear how he fared upon his third voyage. The other guests parted into their homes, but all returned at the same hour next day, including the porter. Again, after the feast was over, did Sinbad claim the attention of his guests and began the account of his third voyage.